Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I just first want to acknowledge you and thank you for everything. Thank you, Lord God, for uh, just continually showing us how much you care for us, oh God, and how uh, consistently you love us even as we go through discipline and training and being humbled. Lord, I just pray on tonight that um, you encourage your people on tonight. I pray that you bless your people on tonight. I pray, oh God, that you help the mindset of your people to be changed on tonight, that your people will be matured uh, by the word that, that you give me on tonight, oh Lord God. Please help me to speak. Please, uh, we ask for your presence and anointing, oh Lord God. Um, we ask, oh Lord God, that you help us to change and continue, oh Lord God, to give you our best every day, oh Lord God. Um, in Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand, amen. Amen. So uh, just a few things before I get into the word. Um, I, had this, I had this thought as the worship was singing the first song. And you know the first song of worship was There's Another in the Fire. You guys know that song? So now every time I read in the Bible about how um, the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how, how um, they got thrown in the fire and the king comes and says, look, you know, there's a fourth person, right? And he looks like a god, right? Every time I read that now, I think about uh, the fire books, right? And that now I always think about how God set a precedence for what he's doing in the fire books, right? Basically, um, the fire books is not the first time God took somebody and put them in the fire and let them walk around in the fire without being harmed, right? Because we read the fire books, and he's taking people to hell, and they're walking around in the fire without being harmed, right? So <clears throat> now every time I think about um, the Hebrew boys, and I read that story, or there's a worship song that references that story, I think about the fire books, and I think about how personal uh, uh, their testimony, what they went through is for us, because that revelation is for us in our ministry, right? The rest of the world doesn't know that. The rest of the world thinks God did that thousand years ago and it never happened again, right? But we are some of the only people in the world that know God is still doing that. And it's not crazy. There's a biblical precedence for what he did, right? For what he did, he did in the fire books, right? With, with um, Nebuchadnezzar and, and the three Hebrew boys. So I just wanted to say that because it came to my head when I, um, when I heard that song. I was just encouraged by it. Amen? Um, so, you guys, did you guys see on the band how you, Pastor, um, gave me the Christmas present with the, <laughs> gave Joel the Christmas present? Um, so, you mean, of course, right? So, for, for you, for you guys who don't know, right, you, Pastor, um, he gave, he gave uh, Joel a Christmas present. It was his fire starter kit, right? And, and uh, they put the video on the band, and I'm sitting there looking at this kid, and I'm thinking, they about to give a two-year-old fire? <laughs> right? And I'm like, they about to give Joel fire? Right? And... I know it sounds ludicrous to even think that, right? Like, but after the whole Christmas tree stunt, like after when he first uh, uh, brought up the idea about us going out to cut down a Christmas tree, I didn't really take that serious, right? I thought that was more of a joke, right? Until, you know, the time came and they're like, all right, you're ready. And I was like, dude, you serious? We really about to go cut down a Christmas tree, right? So after that, and then just coupled with the fact Yes. Yeah, after that, and then just coupled with the fact that, you know, they're from Washington, right? So I'm thinking, I'm thinking maybe this is how, you know, they do in Washington. I don't know, right? <laughs> so <clears throat> I was sitting there for a long time, right, trying to wrap my mind around <laughs> giving Joe fire, right? 
I was staring at this picture and I was like, is that real fire, right? Is it, I'm thinking, maybe it's fake fire. Maybe it's some kind of <laughs> fake flame or something, right? And him and, him and Megan sat there for a long time and didn't let on, right? They sat there and looked at me for a long time, right? And I didn't open the box. I just, I just sat there looking at it, right? Um, oh, man, they got us good. They got us good. Oh, praise God. Um, so he's they up, right? They 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 up uh, two to one on us, right? Youth pastor has been um, hinting at the idea of us uh, uh, doing a YouTube channel about a black family and a white family living together. <laughs> so. I think that's the second episode, right? So we'll see if that actually happens, right? But uh, uh, we may be making progress in that direction because our house definitely has comedy. Amen? So, all right, let me get to... Uh, okay, so let me give you guys an update on just um, Hope's family life and business, right? So... As far as um, the business, business, we're in a season where God is basically um, humbling us and business. We've been in probably a good four plus months of just extremely slow business. And um, uh, God said we have a lot of things to learn, right? So as business is slow, we're like resetting uh, uh, financially. Um, uh, we have to basically go back to like basic foundational thinking, living on a budget, which I'm comfortable living on a budget. Like I came here, I have been living on a budget with the boys for like years. So it's not a big deal for me. I think it may not be as easy for my wife, but, um, she is <clears throat> doing her best to, um, kind of, uh, uh, come to this place where she can be okay with with uh, living under like a more tight financial situation. Amen? Um, our whole family is basically under a lot of pressure, right? You know, we always have the spiritual pressure and there's financial pressure and basically we all have to change. So um, it's not just my wife, even though my wife has a lot um, on her plate as far as passing her tests and just the business and house and, and everything that she has to do with being an elder. Um, it's also, you know, myself, you know, I, part of my issue is I tend to, since we've been married, I have issues with reverting into this Ahab person where I don't want to hold my ground and confront my wife for certain things. So in this season, I have been being very firm with my wife. I've been being very firm with Selah actually, and they've been responding well. Sayla just passed her test, and she got her driver's permit. Amen? Um, I think that was I think that was her third time taking the test. She's been stepping up at home. Basically, she has, you know, certain hours at home. She has to help out around the house, so she's been helping Megan um, with the kids. She's been helping out with cooking. Um, she's, she, her, her fried rice, she's been making fried rice and just basic cooking around the house. And her main thing is not just helping, but helping with a good attitude. So she's been actually, her attitude has been just getting a lot better. And it just makes everything uh, uh, flow better. Because, you know, there's days my wife don't get home till 7, 8 o'clock at night. So she's been helping out. Um, as far as... Uh, um, my wife, like I talked about, she is going through her own breaking, and, you know, she's been, you know, changing diapers this whole time, right? But um, there's other areas that God is dealing with her, and it's, it's um, like I said, we're all under this pressure, and this pressure is basically molding us, right? I mean, you have no choice when you live under pressure except but to be molded by it right? It's going to affect you, right? And you stay under this pressure long enough, 
you're going to come out a different person, right? So, um, I mean, I've, I've told you guys several times that had it not been for the, the heavy trials I went through after my divorce and me and the boys and being a single parent, I would not be here, right? I would never have come to a church like this and let somebody uh, uh, instruct me on my life and all of these things. But because of the pressure of that situation, right, now, you know, I am who I am, right? And so I appreciate God putting this pressure on us, right, um, that is molding us into be the people that we'll become in the future. Amen? So that's just an update on kind of what's going on with us, right? Um, it's not, it doesn't feel good. It's not easy, right? I'm sure... Um, I'm sure the same for Sayla and for my wife. It's not easy, right? But it's definitely, I'm definitely grateful. You know, I can even now see, like, this part of our testimony, you know, is going to be precious to us in the future. Do you know what I'm saying? Just based on going through things in the past, and you guys know from when you were gone, have gone through in the past, um, and things have turned out a certain way, then when you go through now or in the future, at least you have some understanding about the process and you have faith in the process. Amen? So, you know, we have full faith in, in the authority we submit to in the ministry and in the process and that we are where we're supposed to be. So, you know, it's okay. You know, we're, we're up for it. Amen? Um. So, yeah, that was just, the, you know, the update. Now I'm going to get to, we'll get to the word, amen? Um, can we get Joshua 10 and then uh, verse 5? And it says, Therefore the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up. They and all their hosts and encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. So um, I don't know if you guys remember, but the last time I was up here, I talked about the Gibeonites. And I talked about how they came and surrendered themselves to Joshua. And they put on the, um, the holy clothes and they had the old bread and they submitted themselves. And they had to be the woodcutters and water carriers for for Joshua and the Israelites, right? Um, and I talked about, you know, what it meant to surrender. Amen? So I just want to um, touch on this because it's kind of a continuation of that, right? But this is about the divine protection that comes with surrender, right? There's a lot of benefits, right, when you surrender to God, and this is one of them, right? So basically, that first scripture I read is that, there's these other five kings, right, that all allied themselves and decided to go to war against uh, Gibeah because they had surrendered, right? And for us, you know, when we are in the world, we are allies with the world, right? And so when we try to come into God's kingdom, the world's not happy about that, right? And the world will come after us, right? Um, the Lord said that, when the spirit goes out of a man, it goes through dry places, finds seven other spirits worse than himself, right? So in their case, five other kingdoms, right, actually came and tried to, like, take them back. Amen? Can we get Joshua 10 and verse 4? And it says, and this is uh, uh, the Gibeonites replying to Joshua. And it says, come and help me destroy Gibeon. He urged them, for they have made peace with Joshua and the people of Israel, right? So this is, I'm sorry, this is the five kings um, asking, you know, rallying themselves to come and attack the Gibeonites. So when you read this story, a lot of times, if you're not really paying attention to what you're reading, you're just going to see, you know, Joshua starts this huge conquest and you're going to think that Joshua is just going and he's just conquering these people. And these are just enemies that is coming against Joshua. But this enemy is not coming against Israel even. This enemy is coming specifically against uh, 
the Gibeonites, and the Gibeonites call Joshua to actually come and protect them. Amen? So they come to attack the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites, who have just surrendered, immediately turn to Joshua and say, please, you got to come help us, right? There's nothing we can do. And, and basically, when you, you know, we all know the famous story in the Bible about how God stopped the sun and did all these great things, you know, for Joshua, right? All that was to protect the Gibeonites, though, right? That's how serious God was about the divine protection, right? Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't even just the sun. There's actually uh, other verses in there that say that um, there was this great hailstorm, right? And it says that more people died from the hail than actually from the swords of the soldiers fighting, right? So when the Gibeonites surrendered, right, God so wanted to show up, right, and fight for them that he actually directly killed more people in supernatural ways, right, than the actual army of Israel that was fighting actual physical people, right? I mean, this is a miraculous, uh, uh, this is a miraculous uh, victory for Israel, and it's one of the most famous battles in the whole Bible, right? You know about Hezekiah and how the angel kills 180,000. These are some of the most famous battles in the history of the world, right? And God did this for the Gibeonites when they surrendered to just to emphasize a point of how, uh, um, how big of a deal it is when we surrender and, and how the blessing of God and the divine protection is on you when you surrender to God, right? Um, you know, there's a story in the Bible where the Lord says, Will a soldier with 10,000 soldiers, will the king with 10,000 soldiers, when he sees the, the enemy come in with 20,000, you know, what is he going to do, right? Is he going to try to make war with them or is he going to send a delegation of, of peace, right? And I, and I talked to you guys last time about the delegation of peace was the surrender that the Gibeonites offered to Joshua and to the Israelites, right, when they humbled themselves, right? And they humbled themselves, like, beyond normal humility, right? They really made themselves look bad, right, on purpose. Amen? Um, our humility, right, when we come to God and, and surrender to him, um, I just want to emphasize, like, we really have to go low. We have to go much lower than we think we have to go. And we cannot focus on, you know, what other people think and what we look like. And we can't focus on, we can't even focus on, we really have to keep our eyes focused on God while we're humbling ourselves. Or we won't be able to go as low as we need to go. Amen? And so the Gibeonites, you know, are an amazing example of that, right? We need to really grab onto their testimony because we're all called to humble ourselves in that way, right? We may not be able to look at the other ministries in the world, right? Because the other ministries in the world, they're not called necessarily to show uh, how the authority of God works like this ministry is, right? So we may have a greater call to humble ourselves than them, right? So we really have to keep our eyes focused on God and focus on his word because this is all biblical but it's not normal in the world amen so you know for us uh I just want to encourage you right and when you read this story hopefully in the future you don't see it the same because now when I read the story I don't see it the same right just like I said about the Hebrew boys when I read that story now that story is personal to me now because of the fire books and I don't see it the same as the rest of the world, right? When you read the story about the Gibeonites, uh, 
hopefully from now on you don't see it the same and you see yourself, right, being that person who can go that low. And, and then the divine protection and the rest of the benefits that come with that allow God to glorify himself in a way that's rare in the whole Bible and in the whole world because of the humility of the Gibeonites. Amen? So your humility is a big, is a big, is a big thing. Amen? <clears throat> I'm sorry. I didn't get to send you guys all the scriptures, so I'm figuring this out as I'm, as I'm talking. Amen? <clears throat> Oh, I do have it. Joshua 10 and 11. And this is the scripture I reference. And it says, as the Amorites retreated down the road from Beth Horon, the Lord destroyed them with a terrible hailstorm from heaven that continued until they reached Azekah. The hail killed more of the enemy than the Israelites killed with the sword. Right. So, again, this is God putting his mark on this battle. This is, you know, there's times when there's things that happen in the world that just seem natural. And if you're not looking at it from a spiritual angle, you'll just miss it, right? This is not one of those times, right? This is one of those times where everybody involved understands that this is God intervening in this battle. Amen? And God is supernaturally using hell and other means. And I believe God specifically, uh, uh, is not using the Israelites to make this point, right? Because they're there and God could have just, you know, given them the strength and the anointing to just use their swords. But God specifically chose to supernaturally do this because he wants to emphasize this to us, right? Because we all want God to show up supernaturally. Amen? I mean, when God shows up naturally, it's fine. We receive that. But I don't know about you, but... I like miracles. Praise God. Right? I mean, that's why we're here. We read the five books, right? We was like, this is amazing. Amen? So, you know, if we want uh, those amazing, miraculous things from God, right, we have to humble ourselves, right? We have to be an example of what humility is. Amen? Right? The Bible says that, you know, everybody who humbles themselves, God is going to raise them up. Amen? All right. I just wanted to touch on that. I'm going to move on. Uh, last point on that in, in Joshua 10 and 2. And it says, and I'll just read it. I won't make you go there because I'm trying to get to the main, more of the main message. And he said, he and his people became very afraid when they heard all this because Gibeon was a large town. So basically, when those five kings heard that Gibeon had surrendered, they became afraid, right? And it says that they were as large as the royal cities and larger than AI and that the Gibeonites uh, were strong warriors, Right? So the last point on that is that the Bible specifically wants to make the point that even though they humbled themselves in that way, these were not weak people. These were not, it wasn't that they didn't have the ability to fight. The Bible is letting you know these were strong warriors, the Gibeonites were, right? So it doesn't make you look weak to humble yourself and surrender to God. Amen? It does, it, that is not what it means. That's what the enemy will tell you. Right. This, that's what the enemy will come to your ear and try to make you think. Right. That you're looking so weak and like, especially for us guys. Right. Because we want to look strong. Amen. Women, it might be easier for, for the women. Right. I don't know. Some mannish women uh, walking around, but mostly for the guys. Right. Um, we want to look strong. Guys want to have this you know, appearance that, you know, we're handling everything, that we can do certain things, right? It does not make you look weak, right? It does not mean that you are weak when you humble yourself, 
right? You could be recorded in history as a strong warrior of God, right? Like they're forever remembered in history as these warriors because God said they're warriors, right? So you would rather have God write your testimony that's eternal saying that you were a strong warrior than you trying to prove by your own strength you're a strong warrior, right, without God and end up eternally looking weak. Amen? So we have to change change our thinking. This is eternal thinking. This is kingdom thinking. Amen? Okay. Now I said that was the last one on that. So let's move on, right? This, this one, um, I was... I was excited. When I got this revelation, I actually jumped up out of the bed and started preaching to my wife. I'm not joking to you. I actually, I was reading this on the Saturday, and I jumped up, and I made my wife sit down and say, woman, you got to hear this. Because, <laughs> you know, we're in this season. I just explained to you we're in this season, right? So, you know, I hope when you guys read the Bible, you read it with, like, this curiosity, right? I'm very curious about Things of God. That's why I was getting in trouble trying to go into the spirit realm. I'm just curious. I just want to peek in. I just want to see. You know what I'm saying? So when you read the Bible with a curious mind, I think God satisfies my curiosity, right, by giving me this revelation about certain things. Amen? Can we get um, Daniel 9, uh, verse 1 through 3 in the NLT Bible? I think I sent you that one. And this one is about... So, you know, you know, I've been here 10 years, and you guys have been here, and you guys have heard this term, right? Um, we're headed into a new season, right? Uh, this season was this, and now we're going into another season, and we, we talk a lot about the seasons, amen? Um, God gave me some revelation on what happens when the seasons change, and I, be, I was excited when I found this out, right? So, I hope you guys had the same excitement, Amen? So it says, it was the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede, the son of Ahasuerus, who became king of the Babylonians. During the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, learned from reading the word of the Lord as revealed to Jeremiah the prophet. So he's reading the book of Jeremiah, probably before it was was the book of Jeremiah. Um, That Jerusalem might lie desolate for 70 years. So I turned to the Lord and pleaded with him in prayer and fasting. I also wore rough burlap and sprinkled myself with ashes. So basically, Daniel is reading the word and he gets this revelation. Right. So first point is he got the revelation through reading the word. Right. You guys have to come to this place where you can, you know, where you. Read enough of the Bible to where it's more than just reading about history, where you're actually getting revelation. Daniel got this revelation, and it and it's it was the beginning of the change and season for all Israel, right? That he got this revelation. Amen. Um, can I get Daniel 10 and then uh, 12 and 14? And it says, then he said. Don't be afraid, Daniel, and I'm going to put all this together for you. Then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel, since the first day you begin to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before God. Your request has been heard in heaven. And this is an angel talking to Daniel. I hope you guys are familiar with this passage, right? It says, I have come in answer to your prayer, but for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Then Michael one of the archangels came to help me, and I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. And this is, now I'm here to explain what will happen to your people in the future, for this vision concerns a time yet to come. Amen? So, Daniel is reading the word. He gets the revelation. God, like, directly impresses him to start fasting and praying, right? And he goes on his 21-day fast. And as he's having a 21-day fast, right, at some point, uh, uh, an angel comes to him and explains to him 
um, why it took him 21 days, right? Um, if you read like this whole thing, you know that he explained that um, the angel came to help Michael and he explains a little bit about what's going on in the spirit realm. The part that, uh, that got me so excited, right, is when he says, this angel comes to help Michael, and it says that Michael, it, it is, Michael is like over the church. I don't know if you guys know that the Bible says that Michael is like the angel of the church, right? Um, and when Daniel fasts and prays, this angel comes to help Michael so that the prayer can get answered. Because Daniel is praying for this 70-year season for God to turn the season, right? So what I was excited about is when the season changed, God had already sent the spiritual reinforcements to help Michael, who's warring and protecting the church so that the prayers can get from heaven to earth. Amen? The spiritual atmosphere over Israel changed when the season changed. Amen? You guys know in the Old Testament, God said that when he was laying out all the curses, right? One of those curses, he said, I'm going to make the sky brass, right? Nothing is getting through. Your prayers is going up to the ceiling and falling back down, right? That's because the spiritual atmosphere changes. When God withdraws his forces, and you know there's a war between light and darkness, when God withdraws his forces, right, that's warring on our behalf, right, none of the prayers is getting through, right? You could pray all you want, right? When they're in that season of 70 years, they in that season 70 years, and it's decreed for that time, and there's nothing they can do. There's no prayer. There's no offering. There's, no, there's nothing they can do. They just have to wait their time. Amen? So, but when this 70 years is up, God impresses Daniel, who gets the revelation through reading the word, and I'm sure he's been reading this. Right? Because Daniel is faithful. Daniel is praying three times a day. Daniel is in his word. So Daniel has seen this before. Right? But God specifically gives him this revelation in time for their season. Amen? So just like, you know, we all could be continuously reading the word and you have to stay continuously reading and God will speak to you specific to the time that you need to get certain revelation. Amen? So you can't think, oh, because I read the Bible once, you know, so many years ago that you just got it. That's not how that works. Um, you can take a book, and I've done this. You can take a book like Genesis or some other book. You can continuously read this book. I remember I, one time I specifically just sat and read Genesis like five times. Each time you get something different out of this book. Each time you get something different, right? In the last week, I probably went through the book of Daniel, I don't know, ten times. Just, you know, each time you get more out of the book. I'm sure Daniel has read the book of Jeremiah before. But this specific time, God is impressing him because now it's God is basically using him, who's the authority, right, to, he's going to give this revelation to basically the rest of Israel. Because, you know, there's other people that God has set up because they're about to start rebuilding the temple, all of that's coming, right? But this is the beginning of it. None of that can start while they're in this season of discipline. Amen? So why this was so exciting is because our season has just changed, right? Our authority has been telling us for months, hey, our season is about to change and we need to be ready. You remember that? We was just, for months, going over this. We need to be ready when the season changed. Then the season changed, and what changed? Not much change, right? There's some people got breakthrough, but for most people, not much change. Why? Because you got to have this revelation so you know now it's time to act, right? Daniel got this revelation, so now it's time for Israel to begin to act. There's certain things they need to start doing in order to prepare to start rebuilding the temple. Amen? So 
when the season change, the spiritual atmosphere shifts, right? Most people are not sensitive to that. So if you just don't pay that message no attention and you continue doing the same thing in this season as you did in the last season, it's not going to make a whole lot of difference for you, right? So when, that's, when the, the season changed, now God has changed and set the spiritual atmosphere. There's prayers that you can get answered in this season that you couldn't get answered in the last season. Amen? Amen. That's why I was so excited, right? Me and my wife have been trying to figure this business thing out. We've been up and down. We've been fighting. And when I got this, I was encouraged because I said, okay, there's prayers that are going to get answered now that I couldn't get answered before. Why? Because church is in promised land season. Amen? Promised land season. We can all move forward. Amen? So I'm telling you I was so excited. I am like, I'm practically jumping on the bed. I'm like telling my wife, like, because there's only so much you can do. Right? If you're in a wilderness season, right, nothing grows in the wilderness. It's a desolate place, right? I think in the wilderness, as they got close to the promised land, they had a few breakthroughs, but for the most part, there's nothing too much happening, right? They're just repenting and they're just learning, right, to, to get cleansed and they're just in this process, right, preparing for this next season. Amen? So now, when this next season changed, now the spiritual atmosphere is different. Now God says, okay, I'm ready now. I'm ready to receive your prayers now. The angels are ready now. I've sent the, the reinforcements now, right? Your, the, the spiritual breakthrough, right, is going to happen now, right? Because you have the extra reinforcements, right, in the spirit realm. Amen? Now, when you pray, the advantage is with you. Do you realize this? Because of those angels, right, that are assisting, right? You know, when Jacob, Jacob's ladder, when he slept on the rock, right, and he had that dream of the angels ascending and descending, right? That's, that's for us, right? They are uh, bringing answers to prayer, taking prayers up. They are bringing resources. They're bringing, there's anointings and there's, right, spiritual gifts. There's all things coming up and down on this spiritual elevator, right? that the angels participate in. Amen? Pastor Kim, we had a revival, uh, and Pastor Kim said, there was like a fire angel here. And he said, that's rare, right? The angel, is a, he's on this spiritual ladder. Just, and there's, I'm sure there's a, there's a gajillion angels, right? We don't know all of them, right? But my point is, when God decrees that the season change, and remember that the Lord told the disciples, he said, it's not for you to know right? The seasons and times that God sets by his own authority, right? God has decreed a thing. There's nothing we can do. And, and we don't know all that's going on, right? This is just a small glimpse. And I believe he told the disciples that because they weren't at that level. Daniel got that revelation because he is like, you know, Daniel's close to God. Amen? The rest of Israel doesn't have this revelation. Amen? The rest of Israel, they just got to listen to Daniel. Amen? So they have to receive the word from Daniel and just begin to move in faith. Amen? Um, and I, I'm, I'm not going to go all into, because this like coincides with stuff that's happening in other books, right? But um, Daniel was uh, like involved in the leadership of Babylon through several kings, right? Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, Cyrus, right? Several kings. And he's doing things, right? He's interceding for his people, but he's also living such a life that these kings are being converted, right? Um, Nebuchadnezzar actually testified, right? God humbles him, and he comes back and testifies that, you know, our God is the only God, right? Everybody has to submit to this God, right? All of that is setting the atmosphere so when they go and start rebuilding the temple, amen, and, and we know now that we are the temple, amen, um, so when they go and start building, because there's still opposition, right, there still were people trying to hinder them from building the temple. That part still was there, but just the fact 
that the spiritual atmosphere had changed and God had even changed the mind of the leaders and people in authority, right? So that when they sent the petition to the king, right, the king would grant the request now. Whereas before, that was not going to happen. Amen? Um, can I get Daniel 5, 25 and 31? 25 through 31, NLT. Did I send you that? Yeah. I'll just start reading it, and you can put it up when you get it. And it says... This is the message that was written. So basically, after King uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he dies, his successor comes, right? But his successor happens to be king when the season changed, right? So Israel's season affected more than just Israel. Israel's season affected, like, all of Babylon, right? Because God changed the authority of all Babylon, right, for Israel's season, because God has to put people in place who are going to do his will and his plan. Amen? Whether in the church or not in the church, right, because God runs everything. Amen? So it says, this is a message that was written, and basically his successor comes, he's like young, foolish guy, and he takes all of the cups and holy uh, uh, instruments from the temple and just starts having a party, basically showing off, right, for his people. And you guys know, know this story about how the hand came and, and wrote this message on the wall. And you guys know that's the saying, right, the writing's on the wall. You guys ever heard that saying? That saying comes from the Bible. Amen? Um, so it says, this is a message that was written. It's meany, meany to cow parson. This is what these words mean. Meany means numbered. God has numbered the days of your reign and has brought it to an end. He's telling this to the successor of Nebuchadnezzar. And it says, to cow means weighed. You have been weighed in the balances and have not measured up. Parson means divided. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was dressed in purple robes. A gold chain was hung around his neck and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom and just so you know at this time this kingdom ruled the whole world this wasn't just like one country or something like this uh, Nebuchadnezzar God put the whole world under his authority um, I personally believe that since Israel did not accomplish what God wanted to accomplish God just got somebody else and and they they went all the way and basically when that king repented Now the whole world is under the authority of God. Amen? And God did that through unbeliever. He brought in unbeliever, and he's like, you know, I'll get him saved later. But he's going to do my will. Amen? I don't know if you know, but God calls the kings his servants. Amen? And it says, then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was dressed in purple robes. A gold chain was hung around his neck. He was proclaimed third highest ruler in the kingdom. Um... That very night, Belshazzar, the king, was killed, and Darius the Mede took over uh, the kingdom at the age of 62. And Darius is the king who was reigning when Daniel actually went into the lion's den, and, and God protected him. And so when God uh, uh, showed up for Daniel, now Darius is basically a believer. Amen? So you know, Daniel has testimonies that help uh, the King Nebuchadnezzar, right? Then they had testimonies with King Darius. Basically, because of Daniel's faithfulness, right, God was able to glorify himself so that the administration of the whole planet, because these guys are running the world, right, could change all for Israel. So because Belshazzar is running the world, basically, when Israel's seasons change, God is like, fire, right? And he don't have no time to repent. He don't have God sends an angel, writes a message. Daniel comes to interpret the message, and they're trying to promote Daniel. And Daniel's like, you can keep your position. You can keep your stuff. Daniel already knows it's done, right? Daniel's a super wise guy, right? Um, 
God reveals so much revelation to Daniel, not only about what was going on in, in Israel and the kingdom, but also in all of history. Daniel wrote a prophetic revelation that, that spans all of time. All of time. Unto the end. Amen? That's revelation. Amen? So it is possible, right? There are people, right, that God is willing to entrust with that kind of information. Amen? Really? Oh, wow. I'm so, okay. I'm running out of time. <laughs> um, so let me hurry up. Man, that time went so fast. Okay, so basically, in a nutshell, right, um, I was super excited when I learned um, I got a little revelation on what happens in the spiritual atmosphere when the seasons change. And I want to encourage you guys, now that the seasons change, do not continue in the same way you continued in the last season. Amen? Do not continue in the same mindset. Do not continue with the same habits. Do not continue to talk the same. Do not continue to relate to each other the same. Do not continue to view your authority the same. Do your best, right, to examine yourself and see where can I change now, right? Promised land thinking is not the same as wilderness, wilderness thinking. Amen? So, so now, and this, and I also want to remind you, right, be, I know a lot of you guys watch a lot of other ministries, right, uh, uh, on TV and YouTube, and I try not to because some preaching is time-specific, and this word is specific for us. So if you're watching something for another ministry and you're trying to apply it to your life because you're not under that authority, that may not work for you. Amen? And if somebody else is trying to watch this, they need to be under this authority because this season applies specifically to us. Amen? So, you know, I'm not saying you can't watch it, but I'm saying you want to be careful, right? If you're just trying to watch a whole lot of stuff and then you mix the preacher from here with a bunch of the preacher from there and you just mix it all together and try to make sense out of it all, that's going to confuse you, right? Some of that stuff is specific to those people and their season and their ministry just like this is specific to us and our season and our ministry. Amen? So you want to be careful with, with that. Amen? Um, uh, I had this I had this thought. I had this thought. Um, and basically, you know, me and my wife have been working at trying to uh, uh, get this business successful. And we've been up and down for like five years, basically. And I had this thought, and I believe God was asking me to start, right? It's like, what, you know, would I be okay? Because if you look at somebody like Abraham, who didn't fully receive the promise, or like Moses, Moses didn't go into the promised land. But these people were instrumental in moving the needle forward for everybody. And, and I sat there and I was thinking, would I be okay if all I did was move the needle forward for the next generation? Would I be okay? I know pastors hinder several times, right? Some people are just having kids and that may be your contribution. And that never, I never really liked when he said that. I'm just being honest. I got a lot of kids. I love them. But I want to have fun too. Amen. I'm just being honest. But I sat here and, you know, with, when God gave me this angle, right? And you put yourself in that class of people, right? Um, there's a lot of martyrs. There's a lot of people who sacrifice just so the needle could be moved forward for the kingdom of God and for everybody else and for the people that come after them. There's people who come to America, first generation, that never get to live the good life, but because of their sacrifice, their kids become doctors, lawyers, business owners, and live the good life. Amen? And, they, and their whole thing is they, all they did was help move the needle forward. Amen? And I, and I was sitting there thinking, would I be okay Right. If I was one of those people that God used me in heaven, I'm sure 
Abraham, Moses, and these people that are moving the needle forward, I'm sure they're blessed. Right? They're blessed for the sacrifice that they made. Right? Because the people who made it into the promised land still had a lot of problems. Amen? So I, I thought about that, and it actually helped me not to be in such a hurry. Right? Because I'm thinking, God, I'm getting old. I'm 45. <laughs> it ain't the same job in a Corvette when you're 60 as it is when you're 20. <laughs> Y'all know that's not the same. You see them old dudes driving that car, you're like, he too old to have that car. I know I'm not the only person who thought that. You see that old dude with the young girls like, man, what you going to do with that? You can't do that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, but now this is, this is, you know, we have to grow up in our thinking, right? And, you know, on Christmas, I took a picture of my whole family, right? It's me, it's the boys, and I got grandkids here, right? It's lineages that God is laying. And so for me, I can directly, you know, it's like, would I be okay if God used me just to move the needle forward, right? Because, you know, I'm 45. I got a few more years, right? At life expectancy, 70, right? I mean, if I live to be older, fine, right? But, you know, I may not be here, you know, that much longer, amen? And as long as when I get to the kingdom, you know, God is pleased with me, you know, at some point, right? I mean, because you... You don't want to be the selfish person that says, well, if I can't get to the promised land, nobody can. Right? You don't want to be like Hezekiah at the end of his life who's like, well, it's a good word. At least I'm going to be good. That's, that's what Hezekiah did. Right? And then, you know, a few generations later, you know, uh, Daniel and him is all slaves. Amen? So uh, for me, when God put it to me like that, um, that you in good company. If, if you with people that just move the needle forward. I mean, if you can make it, fine. I still want to make it. I'm going to be honest with you. But if God uses me to just move the needle forward, right, so do my kids, right? You got to think. And I'm not just talking about me in the business. There's going to be people in this church that somebody's going to be the first one to become a millionaire. Somebody's going to be the first one to become a deca millionaire, 100 millionaire. Somebody's going to be the first person to start laying hands on people and arms grow and legs grow. Somebody's going to be the first person to do that, right? But what if you're the person that moves a needle forward for that person? And then we have a breakthrough through somebody else, and then they can help other people, and then the whole church just moves forward. Amen? So I'm not just thinking about myself, right? Like, at some point in this ministry, there's going to be breakthroughs in different areas, right? And we have to all, at some point, come to this revelation that, we all one. Amen? So that you're not so caught up in just you and your blessing and your breakthrough, because that's a, you know, that's a small way of thinking. Amen? Um, I was, you know, pastor says that we are the nation. So I thought about this as far as our nation, right? The United States of America, right? So... The United States of America was established officially 1776, right? That's when we broke free from Great Britain, right? That's when the Declaration of Independence was written, right? Declaration of Independence, and there was a war at the same time that they're writing this declaration, right? And this war uh, liberated us from Great Britain, amen? This war, they call it the American Revolutionary War or the American War of Independence. And so, basically, the birth of America came. They have the Declaration of Independence, and God is teaching us to declare, right? So they have the Declaration, but there's also the war to accompany the Declaration. So they're just not making the Declaration, but they're also fighting at the same time. And this is how they got free. So for us, right, we didn't get free from Great Britain, right? We got free from Egypt. Amen? And God brought us out of Egypt, and he helped a lot, right? But then when they came out, that wasn't the end. Because even though they began to abolish slavery, slavery wasn't fully abolished. So even though we got free from Great Britain, 
everybody in America wasn't free. And so how that applies to you is even though you got free from the world, all of you may not be free. Amen? So this is why you are still at war. So the next war, right, that was almost 100 years later, right, and was accompanied by the Emancipation Proclamation, right, um, is what ended slavery in all of America, and it was like illegal to own a slave at this point. Amen? So it took them 100 years to go from getting free to fully being free. So my point is, there's a process. There was a process for the country, and as we are the nations, similarly, there's a process for us to get totally free. Amen? I just, when I thought about this and this was coming, I said, oh, wow, that's interesting because Pastor keeps calling us the nations. So I'm looking at how did the nation get free? Process. Same process, right? Yes, they're warring, and they're also declaring, they're also proclaiming, right? The emancipation proclamation, right? Root word, proclaim, right? They spoke that thing, they put it in writing, and then they went and fought to make it happen, and it happened. Amen? And yes, it took time, right? And, you know, only God is outside of time. We can't be discouraged by time. But I just want to show you, if the process works for the country, right, it's going to work the same for all of us. Amen? We have to keep declaring, proclaiming. You have to keep fighting, right? This second war, the first war was a war with Great Britain. That was an external war. The second war, Emancipation Proclamation, that was an internal war. That was the North going to war with the South. That's the war within you. Amen? Um, so now that we're all saved, we're all dealing with the war within us. Amen? Um, though proclamations happened at one point in time, but these wars lasted years. Right? Like if you read about how this plays out, the, the, the Emancipation Proclamation, they're like, oh, this happened on such and such date and this year at this specific time. Right? But the war, right, within America, between America itself, lasts like 10 years. Right? So just because you are beginning to proclaim, right, the war, the actual physical battle of you fighting. Remember, you're in a new season. Promised land is warfare. Promised land is warfare. Right? As you enter this warfare season, just know that this war, it may take time, right? And your faith has to bridge the gap. Your faith has to see beyond the time. Your faith has to see beyond the circumstance and the situation. Amen? And we all in here have different circumstances and situations. I just gave you guys an update on my situation. Amen? But there's, there's still, you know, a part of me that I'm looking ahead. Right? I'm looking ahead to when one day I'm going to come here and testify about all this in the past. Right? And, I oh mean, what a great joyous day it'll be. I'm sure there'll be more work ahead because right? we're going to continue to work on ourselves and to work for the, to advance the kingdom of God until we go home. Amen? It'll be just the next chapter. Right? And there's a chapter after that chapter. Right? Because um, God, is, God is the author and finisher. This is God's book. Right? God is writing each one of us. It's going, to be, it's going to be a story. Amen? And, you know, even now, a lot of us have testimonies, right? These are just, you know, pages and chapters in your book that God is writing. Right? And the end of that book is all just to glorify God. Amen? Whew. Okay. So that's kind of, you know, in a nutshell, new season. We have revelation on what this means. There's reinforcement now in the spiritual realm. The atmosphere shifted. It's a different spiritual atmosphere, right? That means that there are prayers that you can get answered now that you could not get answered before. So you should be encouraged to pray. You should be encouraged to read. Amen? You should be encouraged to worship. You should be encouraged, right, to know. And 
the new people who, you know, there's people just getting here, they're going to start in this season, right? Hallelujah. You can't be mad at that, right? That you've been fighting and doing foundation work, amen? You know how I see it is I got 10 years of training that they may not have, amen? So, praise God, it is what it is. You know what I'm saying? It is what it is, amen? And I say that to myself just to encourage myself. Right. I, I don't discount the time I spent, you know, and if God blesses somebody and he will and he will bless somebody. Right. But it's not that I didn't have the training and time and opportunity. Right. To take full advantage. And God is not going to. Just X you out, leave you, forget about you. Remember, Paul said that when he was talking about Israel, he used the analogy of the tree. He said, God is able to graft in the natural branches to that tree if he's able to graft in the wild branches, right? God may bring people that don't look like they're groomed and ready for this and graft them into this tree. But remember, Paul taught us all that God can still graft in the natural branches. And you that have been here 10 years, for this church, you're the natural branches. Amen? So you should always be encouraged by that. Amen? It's just a matter of when you get to the place to fully pass your test, when you get to the place to fully get the revelation, when you get to the place to fully change, and that's different for everybody, right? There's some people who are coming from families that already have a certain level of breakthrough, and you may be coming from a family where generations of welfare and no breakthrough. And so you may have to work harder. I knew if I wanted to go to college and do certain things in high school, I always had to work harder, and that's okay. Right? On the basketball team, there's some people that got to practice harder. Right? There's some people naturally gifted. Right? I told you, my son Nehemiah, Nehemiah is five years old. He could spin the basketball on all five fingers. I remember he could do this as a kid. I remember thinking, I still can't do that. I can never, I can't do one finger. Right? There are some people in different areas that are just naturally, they have certain gifts and talents. Right? You may have to work harder. Right. I've had people come up to me and say, Jay, you go to the gym and you can just boom. And he'd be like, I've been at the gym. I can't. He got to work harder. Right. There's some people spiritually. You may have to work harder and that's OK. You cannot. Uh, uh, I don't feel slighted by that. Right. Because my gifts may be my my stronger areas may be in a different area. Right. But I'm I'm fully confident of the fact that God can use my weaknesses. Amen. And that his grace is available to support my weaknesses. And actually, my weakness is more for his glorification. Amen. So I'm encouraged by that. Amen. And you should be, too. Amen. So I'm going to wrap this up. Praise God. New season. Be encouraged. Uh, uh, If you fail before, you have a greater chance of succeeding now. Amen. And just remember, like, this pattern, right? If it worked for America, a declaration, they were declaring, they fought, right? They're proclaiming, right? And they fought in America's greatest nation in the world. Amen? Right? So if it worked for the greatest nation in the world, it can work for you. Amen? Amen. Praise God.